morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, I am very excited. I'm a little bit tired. Um, but yeah, I know it's early, so I appreciate you guys kind of all getting here. You're going to, you paid for it, right? So um, I always feel, I feel really weird if I never say who I am on the screen. I realize that's a completely redundant kind of slide, but I always feel really weird if I don't say it. So I am Christopher Doyle. Um, <coughs> I'm a graphic designer, and I'm from Canberra. Um, I don't want anyone to worry about that. It's... Uh, <laughs> Generally when, generally, when I tell people I'm from Canberra, they kind of look at you and touch your wrist, and you say, you're all right, you, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> and like somebody's died, or, you know, I had this, I've been through this terrible experience. Uh, and, and the truth is, I am okay, it's fine. I'm quite happy about it. It also puts me in a really unique position to, to discuss this whole kind of Sydney versus Melbourne thing, because I've been in Sydney for about 12 years, but I don't feel like I've come from Sydney, because I've come from Canberra. So I can kind of have this conversation, and people kind of get their backs up. But there is no debate. Melbourne is, in my opinion, the superior city. Uh, I have no issue admitting that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. You guys live here. You know it. I love it. I love it. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a creative director, which again feels like a really exaggerated term. Uh, when I talk about the size of the studio I have, it's a very small studio. Uh, it's myself, and at the moment, one other designer who is abandoning me, uh, called Gabby. This is Gabby. Um, <laughs> Gabby's in the audience, looking, she looks a little bit different to this when you see her face to face, obviously things change when you get up on the screen. Um, but yeah, we're, we're a really small studio, um, which is something I kind of stress about and I'm excited about on different days. Um, we do different, I guess, different types of work, predominantly uh, kind of brand identity work, a lot of print work, um, you know, a little bit of music work. I like to kind of take the piss out of uh, myself and what we do um, from time to time as well. Often that's kind of met with yeah, mixed reviews, but uh, we'll just move on. <laughs> so when I was asked to do this uh, talk, I was going to say by Zach, and I honestly can't remember if it was Zach or Nick. Can anyone tell me? Zach? Nick? No. Zick, <laughs> we'll call him. <laughs> uh, I had three thoughts. The first one was yes, I, and, and, and the reason it was yes is because for two reasons. One, I always, I always say yes to these kind of things. I always say yes to talking at any kind of conference or being part of an event. I love the, I love the idea of sex, drugs, and Helvetica, both the conference and obviously Sex, drugs, and Helvetica. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was a no-brainer. The second thought I had, these were in very quick succession, I think, while I was on the phone, was I'm not qualified uh, to talk at this conference. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. The third one, it off, easily the most important one for me, was new weight loss goal, right? <laughs> so I get asked to go to a wedding or a talk or a funeral. It doesn't matter what it is. Funeral's actually a fairly insensitive way to think about it. In my head, weight loss goal. I'm like, that thing's in two months. I can drop six, seven, eight kilos, I'll get there. People are like, hey, you look really different. You look, and I'm like, yeah, I lost all this. And it, doesn't happen. it never happens. It never happens. So <laughs> I guess the reason I feel like I'm not qualified is I, uh, yeah, I've worked for a, as a designer for about 12 years. And I worked in agencies for about 10 of those years. And then only really over the last year and a half that I kind of resigned from the agency I was in. And I went out on my own and I started up my small studio, and like our friend Michael Finnegan, I feel like I had to really start over, and um, I guess part of that starting over was the realization that the size of the jobs I would take on would be quite small, and, and the type of work and projects I was doing would be uh, very different to what I was doing in agencies. So when I got that phone call, I was kind of like, I don't really know if I, if I kind of have enough to talk about or anything that's interesting enough to talk about. So um, I, I, I had lots of many annoying conversations with uh, with, uh, with Gabby, uh, I started and I messaged Kevin about it a lot, and I kept ringing Zach, I don't know what I'm talking about, man, this is, you know, and all this kind of shit. And I ended up feeling like, okay, it was okay, I know what I'm gonna talk about, and I kind of bent the rules a little bit, and I, I said to those guys, what if I talked about uh, a relationship and a body of work? Um, which, is, it sounds like a really sophisticated term, but it's me just trying to get out of the brief. So, um, I will talk to you guys about process as well. I'm not gonna cheat, but I'm gonna talk about it a different way. Um, so for me, one of the things I'm really passionate about is music work. Um, I think people have this misconception that I was in music work, and I don't. I really only work for a couple of different artists. But it's work I find really, really challenging and really, really exciting, so I wanted to talk about uh, the creative process around that. Um, so I'll talk you guys through client, relationship, uh, the brief, uh, the creative process, my kind of creative process. I go through uh, the challenges and opportunities and goals, and then kind of what the results of that process is. Um, and they're not always kind of what I want them to be, and they're not always as good as I think they can be, but uh, we'll get there. Um, so yeah, a couple of reasons I wanted to talk about music was, um, I think there's a misconception around uh, people thinking musicians aren't really like real clients. You know, they're not like kind of corporate or big clients. You kind of treat them differently. And to me, there's no real difference. I go through the same creative process with musicians and bands as I do other clients. And to me, they kind of deserve the same level of attention. They don't often have the same amount of money, but they deserve the same kind of thought process, and I go through that process. Um, and for me, artwork for albums is, uh, 
is incredibly hard to, so, uh, hard to solve. You know, I, I, I find that process really, really challenging. I always say yes to it. I've always said, yep, I want to do an album cover. Yes, I want to work with an artist. And I find the process uh, almost impossible. I find it really, really abstract. And I, I landed on this sentence when I was talking to someone about it a couple of years ago, that I often feel, once I get really deep into uh, creating music, uh, art for music, that I feel like I'm creating art in response to art. And if I kind of think about that sentence and think about what I'm doing, I get really, really uneasy. Um, and the reason I get really uneasy is because I don't fancy myself as an artist at all. Uh, that's the first thing. I really don't. I'm not comfortable in the art world. I don't, I don't really feel like I can speak about art. And I certainly don't feel like I would, I would call myself a producer of art. Um, so then I'm meant to be doing that <laughs> in response to something really, really artistic and abstract, which is what a musician or a band are kind of putting together as well. <clears throat> and, you know, musicians and artists can be pretty vague, uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty weird dudes from time to time, and they, you know, have spent months and months and months creating something that's often very personal, often, often very uh, poetic and abstract, and I'm kind of meant to come in, or designers meant to come in and kind of respond to that, and it's a really challenging process. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, backtrack a little bit to kind of how uh, I got into one of these relationships and what the creative process has been. I spent about uh, 10 years out the front of, a, of a, what I would class, and I don't know whether the term is relevant anymore, a screamo band. Does anyone know that term? Yeah, right? I considered saying it was an emo band, but we were much heavier than that, and emo does not mean what it meant 10 years ago. I want everyone to know that. Emo was a very different thing. So I kind of spent like 10 years uh, up and down the East Coast kind of screaming about my ex-girlfriends and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's you know, it's kind of like melodic hardcore, like a few little nice bits and pieces and then lots of bits where it sounds like people are killing each other. It's, um, it's not very pleasant for the band or the audience, so it was surprising that it, that it went on for so long. Um, <laughs> while I was in that band, I met up with this gentleman who, who I realised when I looked at this photo looks like a super weird like beard sandwich with my other weird friend in the middle. Um, <laughs> it does, right? <laughs> a little bit of beard in the middle, two big beard buns in there. Um, so... <laughs> This guy on your left is uh, Dave Batty, who became a very good friend. He ran a small record label in Sydney called DC Records, and he kind of saw us play and heard us a couple of times, and he, and he signed us, which was kind of mind-blowing to us at the time because we were an independent band with no money. He said, I'll sign you. I'll, put, I'll start putting out your music. So he signed us, and he put out two EPs through Dave. Um, and I've, I've sort of stayed friends with Dave for a very long time, and even after the band split, I've kind of... I've sort of become really close to him, and he, and he would send me music work from time to time, ads, things like that, freelance work when I was at agencies. Um, and then about five years ago, I got the, the kind of young band with no money phone call from Dave. I'm sure everyone who's ever done a CD cover or anything has had this phone call. They're like, I've got a friend, they're in a band, I don't really have any money, but could you do their CD cover? So I had this call with Dave, um, it was when I was working at an agency called Moon, and he said, look, I've found this band, and I think they're really, really good, and I think they're going to take off, and I think it's going to be big, and you know all these things, and, but they don't have any money. They just started out there sort of 21, 22. Do you want to do the artwork? And I said, yeah, of course. Yes, yes, of course. Knowing that I would hate it, and knowing that I wouldn't want to do it once I got into it, but of course I said yes, because um, that's how I approach these things. Um, the band, of course, uh, the band called the Jezebels, which you guys are probably all familiar with. This is what the Jezebels look like now, sexy, in black, in a loft somewhere. Um, <laughs> Not all the time, but this is pretty much how they look. They're, they're you know, they're a wonderfully uh, attractive young group of people. When I met them, they looked like this. So, <laughs> do you want me to go back just so you can compare <laughs> <laughs> to this? <laughs> so they, they're, you know, they're in, you know, they're in a completely different place uh, now to where they, where they were when I met them. They were in kind of back alleys in. Uh, in Sydney, and they were a very small band, and really, really nice guys. Some of the smartest, most switched on people I've ever had the kind of pleasure of working with. Super, super intelligent, um, super nice, um, lovely people. So then we have the conversation around low budget versus creative freedom. And this is the conversation that lots of graphic designers have with clients, where the client goes, you know, I haven't really got much money, and the designer goes, yeah, well, that's cool, but I need to get a little bit of something out of this as well. You know, and, 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 and what that meant for, for me with the band was I said to Dave, you know, I was going to do uh, concepts, I was going to do it properly, I was going to get a brief, I was going to treat it uh, like I would any job and I would, I would work on it as hard as I would any other job, but there needed to be a little bit of give in how much work I would do, what kind of say, you know, say the band had in the process and how that would work. Um, at the time and sort of still now, I was enamoured with, uh, with the work of a couple of English designers uh, Mark Farrow um, and Peter Saville, particularly Mark Farrow's work was spiritualized and, and the Pet Shop Boys. I thought this work was amazing. To me, it was such a, an incredibly um, consistent body of work that, was, that didn't feel like music graphics to me. It felt like really high-end graphic design, and I, I loved that process, and I wanted to kind of establish that with the band. So I talked to them initially about the whole idea of them being a band and a brand at the same time. 
that was a kind of nervous conversation to have with the band, but it was an interesting one as well. And it was around this whole idea of getting a body of work together that felt like it came from the same place, and it felt consistent, and it felt like it had an aesthetic and a feel and all these kind of things, some of which were things that you could latch onto literally, other things that were quite abstract and quite, uh, quite difficult to pin down. So I'm going to whiz through these just so you've got a bit of background. These are the first kind of three record covers I did with the band. Um, but they were EPs that were eventually turned into vinyls, which was really, really nice as a graphic designer because you get to kind of work on um, a much piece of a much bigger piece of graphic design work. So we did these three. We did these three covers. Uh, they were really straightforward. They were done outside hours. They were sort of shot by either me or a friend, and they were shot at the studio at work. You know, I, this was a this is a classic example. I shot this one myself, and my friend shot this one. I was like, I can do that. It's a piece of piss. So I shot the second one. <laughs> But he had a way nicer camera, and I shot all this stuff um, way too far back because I was like trying to get enough stuff in there for posters. And by the time I actually came to do the record cover and had to zoom in on the girl, the quality of the photo was terrible. So I learned a lot about that as I went through. Uh, I didn't do the next so confidently. Um, I also shot this myself out in this uh, ocean out in the um, out south of Sydney. Um, and again, just on my camera with kind of me in the ocean, her a little bit further in front of me, and, the, and Dave, the guy with the beard, sort of five metres back, knee deep in water, and I was kind of shooting. It was going terribly. I didn't say any of this stuff, but it was going really, really badly. I would look at the back of the camera, and I'd be like, thumbs up, I, we got this, we definitely got this. And, it, <laughs> and then, my, then my card would fill up, and I didn't have enough cards, so I was throwing the cards across the water to Dave, who was kind of in the water, catching the cards and sort of going back onto the sand and putting them in a bag. It was ridiculous and very unprofessional. And then in the car on the way back, and I flicked through the back of the screen, I was there, we are fucked. Like, I... <laughs> Genuinely, I reassured them that we had it, but I genuinely was very, very concerned we didn't have it. And I'd got this girl into the ocean at 6 a.m. It was, it was terrible. Um, so once we kind of whizzed through that, the band sort of changed direction. They got a lot bigger off the back of those EPs. Um, and we launched a, a full-length album, which looked like this. So you know, design-wise, went into a totally different space. Um, and they kind of were so sick of looking at the back of people's heads and shoulders and stuff that they, they said, can we do something really, really different, uh, which I was excited about, and we did. And it was the first time that things had kind of ramped up for them budget-wise. Um, so we commissioned a photographer, a friend of mine, Pierre Toussaint, to, um, to travel down to Canberra and take all these photos of the, uh, of the highway and what, what kind of Canberra looks like in the, in the middle of winter and got these sort of beautiful, really, really lovely uh, landscapes that were really stark, um, no people, and then we kind of ruined them and destroyed them and stuff like that. This was a really big turning point for the band. Um, they won an aria on the back of this album, which was really, really nice, and for me, the album artwork was nominated for an aria as well, which was a really bizarre um, experience, uh, but a nice one, you know, given the, the kind of level of quality that studios like Debaser and those guys produce as well. It was really nice to be included in that kind of crowd. Um, but then everything kind of changed after that, um, and we went through this process of reinvention and relocation, both for the band and for myself. Uh, the band kind of moved overseas. They, they, they had evolved, they changed, they sort of grew up quite a lot, both in terms of age, but also in terms of the kind of music they were writing. Uh, yeah, and they relocated to live in London. Um, I, I don't know if I reinvented myself, that's probably too strong a word, but I definitely relocated. I, um, around the same time I resigned from the studio I was in, it was a studio called Interbrand in Sydney, and I went and set up on my own and started doing my own thing. Um, the relocation was to Camperdown, it's not as glamorous as uh, moving to London, but it's a nice space, you know, if you guys are in Sydney, you come by, it's, you know, I think you would agree, it's quite nice. Um, so I did that, and then kind of everything changed because we started to move into the next record process, and what that meant was that I could approach things in a, in a uh, I guess, a much more thorough um, and more focused way than I could when I was at the agencies, because I was, I was getting paid less for the jobs, and I was kind of trying to fit them in, in and around, um, in and around work and doing it in my own time. And this was the first time I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this next record uh, properly. You know, not that I hadn't put a lot of effort and thought into the other ones, but I wanted to do this record uh, in a way that I felt like I'd given it a lot of attention. Um, so, I started to take briefs. And briefs with musicians are, are not like uh, client briefs. You kind of get on the phone and they sort of talk you through very, very abstract ideas and, 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 and ideas for songs and, and themes and tones. And I always try and sit on the phone and extract as much information about, uh, about the record as I can, usually from the singer, because uh, that's predominantly where the, the kind of the lyrics and everything come from. And then I just kind of try and dig around and dig and dig and dig and dig and see if I can find something. And I, I guess for me, you know, when I go back to saying that this, this process for me is like, uh, is like any other client, is that I try and hang everything on an idea. You know, I, I try and look for a clue or something that I, can, that I can hang my hat on and I can produce and put, and, you know, something I can, a lens I can kind of put everything through and test. Because if I don't have that, I, I suddenly find myself in the art space 
<clears throat> and as I said earlier, that's where I get really, really uncomfortable and I don't know what I'm doing. So I find that really, really uneasy. So Skype rules. You know, we live in an amazing age where I can kind of Skype with Hayley, the singer of the Jezebels in London, two or three times, and she can give me these 45-minute rundowns on what she's writing about and where the record's going. And I'll take you guys through what, what that means or what that is about in a couple of secs. But uh, Skype also sucks because... It means presenting back to the band on a five-way call um, across three countries with them all kind of talking over each other and me talking over them and me doing these really big poetic speeches and then having the drummer say, oh, yeah, I just, I just dropped out just when you started doing that speech there. <laughs> and me having to kind of start again, which is a really, really frustrating process. I mean, this is the, this is the age we live in, isn't it? That you, are, you can have these Skype calls. We were, Kevin was telling us last night as well about him working with SBS and having to basically do everything over phone calls and having the phone kind of cut out because storms would come through his remote Western Australian town and kill the phone. And so it's, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, this technology. Um, uh, but that was quite challenging because I like to be in a room with a client if I can, and I like to, to, to try and tell a story, and I like to kind of walk people through thoughts and process. And it's really hard to do on a PDF. Um, so what I did, I guess, to, to aid that whole situation, and I, and I knew the phone would drop out, I knew the calls would drop out, I knew people would not hear what I was saying and it would be glitchy, was that I wrote really, really thorough presentations. Um, and I, I mean, I always write fairly thorough presentations, but I, I really put a lot of effort into this one. And, and, the, and the, the theory with these ones, and I've done this a couple of times, is that if I wasn't there or the phone goes down or I got struck by lightning or something like that, that the presentation can sell itself. Um, now, that's obviously, a, a, you know, it's fairly confident to say a presentation could sell itself, but what I mean by that is you, you put together a presentation that if, if a client was to kind of go, that's great, thanks, I need to show it to five other people, they can sit down and read it and move through it, and they'll understand what you're talking about without you being in the room. So it's not nearly as good as actually being in the room and talking to people, but it is, um, but it's helpful. Uh, and it's definitely helpful when you're in situations like I was on Skype, when you know things are going to fall apart. So what I wanted to do was run you guys through um, a client presentation. So it, it'll include, it'll recap on the brief, um, so I don't want you guys to think I've skimmed over that, although it was pretty vague. Um, and these are kind of documents that I, that the studio produces for almost every job. They vary in size, uh, depending on the job, obviously. But I, I think I was kind of looking through this presentation thinking, shit, maybe I really overdid this. this. is like a kind of 25 or 30 page presentation for an album cover, which is like, which is pretty ridiculous when you, often album covers are like, oh, my friend has an amazing photo of a dog and I like the typeface impacts, you know, can we, can that be the cover? And that's, that's often how a lot of covers are made, right? And, and I, I, I can't work that way. I don't, I don't get anything out of that. I don't think the band necessarily gets anything out of that. So again, for me, there's a very strategic uh, kind of rigorous research and thinking phase that goes into it. And I have to document all the upfront stuff so they know what they're doing. So I'm going to walk you guys through this, um, this document. As I said, I, I, I don't know. It's going to probably look quite boring, but it's, it's, um, it's documents. So I was talking to Gabby about this the other day, the designer that, that I work with. And it's, you know, she made the point, these are documents that rarely get outside studios. You know, and they don't really go beyond you and they don't go beyond the client. And I think that's... It's, it's something I see all the time. It's probably interesting for you guys to take a look through it as well to see how these ideas get presented. Um, I was using Apicu at this time as well. I think I was the first person in Australia to use that typeface, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not completely sure, but yeah. Well. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this kind of runs you through. I'm not going to read through all of this as well. You guys can read it. Uh, you'll have to read it quickly because I'm going to burn through it pretty quickly. So, um, you know, it's as little things as this upfront slide as well as me basically asking them not to flick through. You know, not, no, don't flick through the presentation. It's going to make more sense if we all stick together and we can go from there. Um, I talk about the fact that I've given the record a title of No Country, which is an interesting thing which I'll touch on again later. Um, photography is indicative. It's all, you know, it's images I found on the internet. Um, but most importantly, it's a starting point and it's a kicking off point and we can, we've got time to refine. Dave was on the call, so I said we can even start again, Dave. A um, little bit of a table of contents, different time zones, obviously. Um, and then I ran them through a little bit of the history. It's obviously stuff they know, it's stuff they've lived with for a long time, but talk to them about where they've come from, both in terms of what they look like, but me trying to kind of pull out, and even though it's my own work, pull out what are the things that I've been able to kind of, uh, the things I've been able to kind of pull out that are consistent, you know, and they were things like photography, simplicity, intrigue, ambiguity, raw, real, con you know, consistency. Talked about the idea of progression, consistency, and reinvention, what they wanted to do with it as a band. And then we talked about being mindful of where we've been in the past, um, not repeating ourselves, aiming for the record to feel new, but also to feel like it's a Jezebel's record. Um, I put these up as goals, which, which sound kind of silly, but it's, it's, it's true, and I think if you kind of set yourself uh, these kind of ridiculous goals, it, it's, it makes you kind of work a lot harder on these things. And certainly with this, I wouldn't want to repeat anything that we'd done before, and I certainly wouldn't do anything that anyone could go, yeah, that, that looks exactly like that, and I wanted it to be great and them to be happy about it. Um, talked about the fact that unless they're releasing a concept album, it's really, really hard to hang everything on a single idea, you know, and that the idea is more about 
kind of centering in on certain themes and certain ideas within the record and figuring out what the dominant ones are and then, and then making the artwork about that. So the themes that came through in the brief, which are really, really interesting, were, were what I kind of split up into be uh, continuing and evolving themes. Um, the continuing themes being obviously the, the, you know, the parts of the band, the parts of the way they write that haven't changed, sexuality, feminism, identity, and romance, both in terms of the artwork, but also the music. They were really, really strong threads. Um, and then what was kind of new, I guess new themes that were sort of talked about on the phone quite a lot, which were much, to me, kind of at odds with those, those, those uh, continuing themes. Censorship, government agents, NSA, politics, um, it, you know, things that were quite different for them to be writing about. And, they, and, and bear in mind, they're in the middle of writing the record, and they're in the middle of trying to craft all these lyrics, and they're in the middle of trying to figure out what the record's going to be about and what they want to say. Um, from that point, I, I just did a lot of drawing, I did a lot of kind of sketching. I didn't really, I didn't really kind of hit the computer that much until I, until I landed on an idea that I really, really liked, um, which was me trying to figure out a visual uh, language or system or icon that I could, that could sum up all of that stuff, but also be vague enough to let people read their own ideas into it. Um, so what I, what I was aiming for was, was this symbol. Um, so I've listed this as a symbol of pride, paranoia, protest, project, uh, protection, honor, and a target and a shield, and also, also for it to be based in some kind of truth. So if, you know, if I am going to approach these things in the same way I do kind of real client jobs, figuring out what's, you know, what's the idea, what am I actually kind of talking about? Um, and I ended up with this symbol, um, which you can see. So I talked to them about it not being a logo. You know? I was really, really keen on convincing them that this wasn't about branding the band, you know? but that like logos, it would have the same sort of uptake and people would wear it with pride, but that it was a symbol of the record and a symbol of that release cycle that they would then abandon once that record was gone um, and that hopefully people would start to get tattoos of it. I was quite confident about that. <laughs> I whiz through this because I'm already running behind. Um, so I talked about photography as well, what we'd done in the past, um, how that it was very people focused, and then there was a switch over to Prisoner, which I showed you guys was us going in a completely different direction, um, and what that meant for photography, and the fact that there's really only so many ways to, to kind of stick within their aesthetic and their feel um, and still do something different. So I suggested that we move into black and white portraiture of people um, in a really modern and nostalgic and timeless way. Um, these were sample images of things that I liked, again, quite inconsistent but the kind of photography and the kind of grades and things that I was looking to do. That photo of Natalie Portman is just like one of the most stunning black and white portraits I've ever seen. I'm not even sure kind of how that stuff happens or why it happened, but I, I love that image. Um, and then I said to them, we need to kind of take these things, take all our themes, and figure out a way to marry them up as well. I really like the idea of shooting people uh, naked or near naked as well, I think, just to make it a bit more extreme and to make it fairly different. And the way that we then did that was we, we did this. So that in one move, you managed to talk about sexuality and identity and romance and censorship and youth and all these things that we were talking about. Um, and, we, and I kind of found a way to sort of quite harshly collide them. What I loved about this was that in a really, really simple combination of image and shape that we were able to kind of minus out people's eyes, you know, and, and which is a very unsettling kind of thing to do. But also we managed to silence people's uh, mouths as well, which I found really exciting. We turned it into a target. We turned it into a, a logo for the band. And, and we had people in there as well, which I thought was really, really nice and relevant. Record covers started to look like this. This is me just kind of playing around with concepts. I tried so many times to get them to use handwriting. I just kept putting it into presentations. They kept writing back saying, we really don't like the handwriting. And then I, <laughs> so I'd do it slightly differently and send it back and go, what about this handwriting? <laughs> to, the, to the point where Sam, the guitarist, is just like, man, we don't want handwriting. And I was like, all right, we're not going to do the handwriting. I really like, this is a Stephen Ward image, I think. I really like the idea of doing it with multiple people as well. I found this stuff really, really unsettling to look at, and I, uh, I really, really liked it, that we could do a series, and that maybe it didn't become about people, it became about targets and other things as well. So I started to get really, really excited about the possibility of this. We even talked about building an app that would allow people to take headshots and, and use the symbol on themselves as well, that they could upload and, and build like an Instagram campaign around it as well, which, which I was told by a very technical person that would have been quite straightforward. Um, Promos and said we could build a giant fucking flag as well. So, to, to me, to me, this was turning into a really, this was turning into a really kind of politically charged, kind of interesting situation. So on the phone, it was approved. Everyone loved it. it was really went really well. They were like, yeah, high fives. It's great. Woke up in the morning, great. Over the next couple of days, it was like, yeah, it's kind of. We just want to tweak it a little bit. Next couple of days, it's like, you know, we're not really feeling it. About a week later, it was. I got a call from the manager. She said, it's, oh, it's done. It's dead. It's, I was like, is it? <laughs> can we revive it? Can we do anything to it? He said, no, it's dead. Um, the feedback was that it was too political, it was too dark, it was too familiar, but most importantly, it just wasn't right. And that was a really scary 
uh, thought for me, that last one. So not only had the band throughout that period started to change what they were writing about, the focus of the record has started to shift as well, which is totally fine. You know, there's no, they kind of found, you know what, it's actually not so much about this, it's about this. And we're on a deadline, I'm trying to do artwork. The most worrying of these statements was that it just didn't feel right. And that's a really dangerous bit of feedback for me to get into. So I had nothing after this, right? I, I remember kind of getting off those phone calls thinking I had a couple of weeks and being really kind of worried about it. I entered into really weird phases. Um, <laughs> I entered into a mood board phase, which is not my style, you know, and I, I went back over. <laughs> well, it's not. It's like I may as well just kind of walk into a room and start, you know, pulling clothes out and putting them on with, that, with my eyes closed kind of thing. So, <laughs> which I didn't do, right? Didn't do. Have my eyes open. Um, so I entered into this mood board phase, which I, didn't even, I don't even know what half of this stuff meant. I was grabbing things that I thought were interesting. I was trying to err it back on the side of romance and, and, and people and sex and all this kind of stuff and feminism, and it just didn't really get anywhere. Um, although I found a lot of stuff I found interesting, I didn't know why I found it interesting. And that's a, another interesting point to come back to later on. I don't know if I come back to these points. I know I said that before, but uh, did I come back to it? No. What was it? <laughs> no one knows. It doesn't matter, right? Um, <laughs> so I may, I may not come back to this later. Um, <laughs> so I then even started making covers out of these things, which again was ridiculous because I didn't know why I was doing it, you know, and I, didn't, I am not comfortable making these kind of big conceptual leaps without knowing why I'm making these decisions. Anyway, we're moving through these mood boards, and I'm, I, I didn't send any of the band this stuff. This is all just me kind of building things um, and trying to get them onto, onto a page and see if anything works, clutching at straws. These were single covers. The first single was a song called The End, um, and I don't know what any of this stuff meant. Um, but in that process, I was looking on blogs and blogs and blogs, a process I find tedious, and I found uh, this cover. And I found this image, and I, and I, in a very strange way, saw it, and I thought, that's the cover of the record. And I, I, don't, know, I don't know where that thought came from, and I sent it to the band, and, and, and he wrote back, and he said, we love it. You've nailed it. You've, cra <laughs> you've, you've cracked it. And I'm thinking, oh, I haven't really cracked anything. I just found the image. <laughs> and I sent it to you. <laughs> And you love it. So this is, I've, I've <laughs> Nick talked about people showing emails, and these aren't particularly interesting emails, but it gives you a couple of clues as to what was going on in my head and the band's. So this is really late at night. This is actually, I'm so fucking happy. We're with the band and we love it, we love you. And I, and I, I feel like, yeah, you don't love me, you love a Polish artist. <laughs> <laughs> whose name is Jarek Puxel. So I wrestled with this for a long time, right? I wrestled with the fact that I hadn't really done this job um, and that I'd gone through all this strategic kind of process and I hadn't really got there. So I wrote back, and I'm, I'm going to whiz through this because I've only really got a couple of minutes left. But the interesting thing to pull out of this is me going, awesome, I'm relieved, which I was. Um, but that second paragraph, if you guys read through, is a really interesting one, which is me going, okay, we're now all in a lot of trouble, okay? Because <laughs> essentially there's six of us going into a gallery going, oh, I like that one. Ooh, that's quite nice. I like that one. And that's a really dangerous space to be in because it's so subjective, you know? So this is me saying, literally, I said it's a dangerous space to be in because we're all choosing favorites. It's abstract. I need to get an idea on the, on the single image. Have you got a title? Still didn't have a title for the record. Um, and then the second last line, I beg you to release a 12-inch without copy on the cover, which is just your, your classic <laughs> graphic designer wanting a nice piece of design without type. Um, he wrote back, should be fine. Did we decide on an image? Uh, oh, no, this is me saying I think I like full bleed. Are we still questioning the lesbian thing? I didn't even know what this meant um, <laughs> <laughs> until, I, until I went back and looked at the photos. And I love this response from Dave. Thanks. No issues with lesbians. <laughs> 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 Only the way it was cropped. So I, I was sub <laughs> unconsciously, subconsciously cropping images to make them look more lesbian-based. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so now I'm in the art world, very scary. It's Anthony Burrell quote, which I love, I like it, what is it, which to me sums up art perfectly. And we had to license all these images from this Polish artist who was the nicest, most excited dude I've ever had any dealings with in my life. I kind of sent him it and said, this is what we want to do. I'm going to send you a contract. He sent us a contract. We negotiated fees. We started to license all these images. And we ended up with a collection of what I think are, are beautiful paintings. Some of the paintings I managed to argue very passionately against the, uh, the guys using, and I won. Some of the arguments I lost, and some of them ended up being used, which I didn't really like. But this is, this is when you get into this kind of space, it becomes about taste. That's the lesbians, girl going down on the girl on the couch. I didn't, I never saw it, right? I never saw it, but, uh, but apparently some people in the band did. Um, and that's where we kind of ended up. So the, the record, I got my record, I got no text on the cover, ended up being a sticker, which I was really, really excited about. And, and that ended up being the CD back cover, lesbians on the back. Um, I realized the other night, putting this presentation together, there's a typo on the back cover as well. I'm not going to tell you guys what it is. And I've never been raised with the band, which I think is really weird. Um, so as I said, my whole thing was like, what have I done? 
Not like morning after, fucking amazing night, what have I done? But literally, what have I done? <laughs> you know, and I, I kind of felt like I went through this really big process and I came out the other end just to kind of go, hey, someone else has done it, what do you think? And, and, I, and I, I, I struggle with that a lot, but it, 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 I came back to thinking about it's, you know, yes, it's about how it looks and, how, and what it says and stuff, but it is around this, this, this very subjective thought around how the record feels. You know, and that's a, that's a really, really hard thing for me to sit down and kind of go, right, here's the brief, here's my research, here's my observations, here's your answer. And while I went through that process and I was really, really happy with it, it wasn't, it wasn't right. And I, once I kind of lived with it for a while, um, I realised that I had gone all the way back to my, my major concern, which is the idea of creating art in response to art. Now, it's, it's, it's art that I didn't create, but it's art that I guess I saw and I realised felt right. And maybe somewhere inside I knew that it was right um, and, and it turned out to be right. But it's, uh, I guess it's a good example of me going through a process that is that's absolutely typical for me and the amount of thinking that goes in and the kind of the back and forth with the client only to kind of find out that, that really it needed to be something that I, I needed to force myself to be looser with and be a lot more um, uncomfortable with. And it's a space that, you know, as I said right at the start, I say yes to these things and I hate the process because I get in there and I don't know how to do it. Um, but I guess the lesson for me was to always say yes to it and open myself up to ways of thinking that aren't necessarily uh, the normally the way I would think. So that's where it ended up. I, I'm, I'm kind of proud of it and I like it, but uh, I didn't do it. So yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Thanks. Cheers.